The budget battle was the first real test for the new Republican majority in the House. How did they do on spending cuts? Why did they give up on those social policy riders? And what's next in the effort to shrink the government? Here to answer all that is House Majority Leader Eric Cantor. Congressman, welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Chris, good to be here. Well, uh, the White House uh, and the President have apparently called an audible after not uh, cutting spending. Uh, they were going to freeze it in the 2012 budget that they released just a couple of months ago. We now hear they're going to announce a whole new plan on Thursday. Your reaction? Well, you know, I, I sit here and I listen to uh, David Pluff talk about you know, their commitment to cut spending and knowing full well that for the last two months uh, we've had to bring this president kicking and screaming to the table to cut spending. Uh, then here they're going to present a plan as far as how to address the fiscal situation and right away um, they're insisting that we have to go about looking at raising taxes again all while holding up the tax agreement that was signed in December. So on one hand we're going to defend that tax agreement but then go ahead and violate it. Uh, then, as you uh, correctly pointed out, uh, the president himself had said he wouldn't raise the debt limit, uh, and now they're flipping on that. So, in, in my opinion, it's really hard to believe what this, this White House and the president is saying. Why do you think the, the, the extreme change and sudden change in strategy from a budget uh, that, that had no cuts in spending, a freeze, a five-year freeze, which they say would have cut spending about $400 billion, to now saying we're going to address everything, spending cuts, entitlements, why, this, why the change? You know, I, I have to believe that the uh, president and the White House are beginning to sense the American people uh, get it. You know, we have a fiscal train wreck uh, before us, and, and unless we act and act deliberately, uh, we're not going to enable our kids to have what we have. And it's as plain and simple as that. Uh, you know, this budget deal that was cut or the spending deal that was cut this week is only the beginning. This is the first bite of the apple, and we've been saying that all along. This is about making the right decisions now. We've got the Ryan budget up this week in the House, which lays out our plan of how we're going to address the fiscal challenges of our country. And Chris, as you know, we've got the debt limit vote coming uh, in several weeks as well. And what that vote is about, frankly, is uh, dealing with the fiscal mismanagement of the past. But there is no way uh, that we Republicans are going to support increasing the debt limit without guaranteed steps being put in place to ensure that the spending doesn't get out of control again. When you say guaranteed steps, what does that mean? What are you going to need in return for uh, increasing the debt limit? Well, well, let's step back for a second. Let's just um, think about a family. When they're engaging in their fiscal affairs and trying to manage their budget, when you hit the max on your credit card uh, and you don't know what to do, First of all, you got to learn how you got there and not commit the mistake again. And if you're going to get an increase in that limit, uh, I think most people would say, okay, let's make sure that we're doing everything we can to not spend the money again. So there are all kinds of things out there uh, that we lay out in our budget that will be up this week. We're talking about putting in maximum caps as far as expenditures are concerned. Uh, we're talking about changing the way uh, that the entitlements work in this country for the future while protecting today's seniors. I mean, these are the kinds of things that we're talking about. But, but let me just make sure I understand, because obviously that was going to be part of the 2012. Are you saying that you're going to try to impose those as part of a deal to raise the debt limit? Well, Chris, you know, just as we saw happen this week in Washington, uh, there comes at time leverage moments here, a time at which the White House and the President will actually capitulate uh, to what the American people want right now. They don't want to raise taxes. They don't want spending to continue to spiral out of control. And those are the kinds of things and mechanisms, whether it's spending caps, entitlement reforms, uh, budget process reforms, these are the kinds of things that we're going to have to have in order to go along with the debt limit increase. Let's talk a little bit about the, the deal that you guys just made to keep the government running. You talk about the fact that well, the spending cuts are kind of a drop in the bucket, but it's a first step in that process. Let me ask you another question. Why did the House GOP cave on all the riders, including funding for Planned Parenthood and EPA? Well, let, let me just speak to the Planned Parenthood issue because um, we believe very strongly uh, that we ought not be spending taxpayer dollars to fund abortion. We fought hard for that. Frankly, the President Harry Reid have a very different view uh, on that issue. Uh, but what we did get is a guaranteed vote in the Senate for all the American people to see where their senators stand on that issue, something that we'd not gotten before. But I can tell you, Chris, around the issue of Planned Parenthood, the kind of rhetoric that came out of members 
uh, on the other side of the aisle is completely inappropriate. And when they're um, saying things like Republicans have come to Washington to kill women, that's just not serious, that's inappropriate, and when you have that kind of environment, you can't get something serious done. Okay, but let me, t let me talk about Planned Parenthood because uh, I've been looking into this, and let's put up these facts on the screen. The federal government has been funding Planned Parenthood since 1970. Each year, Planned Parenthood provides one million screenings for cervical cancer, 830,000 breast exams, three percent of its services are abortion, and none of those are funded by the government don't Democrats have a point that defunding Planned Parenthood is going to hurt women's health? Uh, what, what I can say, Chris, is this. It's, it's all about the fungibility of money. If Planned Parenthood accesses hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayer money uh, and they use that for other purposes, then they can use other dollars to fund abortion. What we believe... But what about a million cervical cancer screenings? What about 830,000 breast exams? The no, heck no, with that? No, no, one, no one differs with the fact that those are good services for women. It's the fact that they deliver abortions uh, is what most Americans don't believe in. And that's why we fought hard to make that point and to deprive the taxpayer dollars from being used for that. Let's talk about uh, the 2012 budget uh, and entitlements. This week, as, as we all know, Congressman Paul Ryan unveiled his budget, cut the deficit by $4 trillion over the next decade, including cuts in Medicare and Medicaid. Are you prepared, you, the Republicans, prepared to go to the voters next fall and say, we stand here right now and are going to say, we will cut entitlements? Yes, Chris, because what we've said and what the uh, Ryan budget calls for uh, are, are spending targets. And the way we get to spending targets is both on the discretionary and mandatory side of the ledger. As we know, the unfunded obligations on the entitlement programs are really what are so daunting uh, and causing global investors as well as Americans to doubt whether this country can deal with its fiscal challenges. So what we've said is this, we're going to protect today's seniors and those nearing retirement. But for the rest of us, all of us who are 54 uh, and younger, I know that those programs are not going to be there for me uh, when I retire, uh, just like everyone else 54 and younger. They can't. We cannot sustain that kind of trajectory. And what we're saying is we've got to bring down the debt in this country uh, we've got to do the things necessary so that our kids are going to have the same opportunities that we do. But it's let's, plain let's, as that. let's talk about the Ryan budget. It would cut Medicaid by $750 billion over the next decade. The nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office says if you take the Medicare changes, this premium support, which some people would call a voucher, that as a result of it, seniors will end up paying more out of pocket for their health insurance than they would under Medicare. What, what, we, what we're talking about in terms of the kind of changes in Medicare is also uh, do, do some things uh, to uh, correlate to folks' incomes. You know, there are people making a lot of money in this country who can actually afford their own health care. Uh, we are in a situation where we've got a safety net in place for, in this country for people who frankly don't need one. We've got to focus on making sure we've got a safety net for those who actually need it. Well, the Medicaid but, people, have a, you're, you're going to cut that by $750 billion. Well, the, the Medicaid reductions are off the baseline. And so what we're saying is allow states to have the flexibility to deal with their populations, their indigent populations and their health care needs the way they know how to deal with them. Not to impose some kind of mandate from a bureaucrat here in Washington. I know, but you're giving them less money to do it. Well, the, in, in terms of the baseline, that is correct. They will have more money over time than what they have now. It's just the level of growth in those programs. And what we're saying is there is so much um, uh, imposition of a mandate that doesn't relate to actual quality of care. We believe that if you put in place the mechanisms that allow for personal choice as far as Medicare is concerned, as well as the programs in Medicaid, that we can actually get to a better result and do what most Americans are learning how to do, which is to do more with less. There has been a lot of speculation in this town about your relationship with Speaker John Boehner, and there is this image that you're kind of itchily waiting in the wings for him to leave and for you to be able to succeed him. Question, did he cement his position as speaker and his support inside the Republican caucus by the way he handled this whole CR debate? Uh, yes, and John Boehner and I have had a relationship. We were in the minority. We were working together very well in the majority. 
Uh, he got everything he could from this president and from Harry Reid as far as spending cuts are concerned. Uh, and both of us come to the table and come to the leadership positions that we do every day wanting to deliver the results that we promised the American people that we would do in November. Uh, it's about cutting spending. It's about managing down the debt in this country so that, frankly, we can have um, a situation where our economy grows and people can get back to work. That's what both of us share in common. We have a very good working relationship. Uh, and we're going to work together to see that these things happen. So you back John Boehner as Speaker of the House. Absolutely. 100%. Absolutely. And I've been on this show, Chris, probably uh, a year ago saying that, six months ago saying that, and I'll say it again now. Congressman Cantor, thank you so much for coming in. Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Please come back, sir. Thank you.